Memory is pretty critical. Without it, we'd never be able to learn, well, anything. We need it to tie our shoes, walk to school, drive a car, study for a test, and even remember the names and faces of our loved ones. It's a complicated process that involves different kinds of memory, several different brain regions, and some complicated biology. Hey there, I'm Ali Astrocyte. It's back to school season, so sharpen your pencils. You're getting ready to stuff your head with all of that new knowledge and try to remember it all. So today, we're gonna talk about what memories are made of, how they're formed, and where they're stored. Yes. You might think that all memories are created equal, but surprisingly, that's not actually true. First off, memories can be short-term, meaning we only remember them for a few minutes or long-term, letting us store and retrieve memories over our lifetime. In neuroscience and psychology, scientists split long-term memory into two big categories, declarative or explicit memory and non-declarative or implicit memory. Declarative memory is how we remember facts and events, while non-declarative memory is responsible for habit formation and skill development among other things. This isn't just a way of categorizing different kinds of memory. They actually seem to be different biologically. We know this thanks to a man named Henry Molaison, better known as patient HM. After a bicycling accident as a kid, Henry Molaison developed severe, life-disrupting seizures. Doctors tried all kinds of medications and therapies, but none of them worked. So his doctor decided to try a radical surgery that removed the parts of the brain causing Henry's seizures, the hippocampus and part of the amygdala. Now keep in mind, this was the 1960s and we didn't know very much about the roles of different brain regions yet. So it wasn't until Henry woke up after the surgery that doctors realized its effects. Henry had severe enterograde amnesia. He could remember his childhood and his life up to a few months before the surgery, but couldn't remember new facts or events. He was unable to form new declarative memories. Surprisingly though, Henry could form new non-declarative memories. He was able to form new habitual memories like walking to the hospital dining room, and he could still complete short-term working memory tasks, like repeating back short strings of numbers. The case of HM helped doctors and scientists realize that the hippocampus is critical for helping the brain form and store long-term declarative memories, while other brain systems must be responsible for non-declarative memory. It also showed that not all long-term memories are stored in the hippocampus. This launched decades of research on memory systems that are still ongoing today. Now we know that memories appear to be stored in different places, depending on the kind of memory. For example, our conditioned emotional responses require the amygdala, while our motor memory comes from the cerebellum, and memories of facts and events rely on the medial temporal lobe, thalamus, and hypothalamus. So, we've learned a bit about which brain regions seem to control our access to different kinds of memory, but how are memories actually stored? Since we know that the brain doesn't really grow new neurons, it's pretty unlikely that individual memories are stored in new cells. But as we've discussed before, our brains are super plastic, meaning that neurons can form new connections or strengthen existing synapses with other neurons and eliminate or weaken old connections. This allows our brains to adapt to handle new information. And most researchers think that memories are probably stored by changing the strength of synapses in the brain. This concept is often summarized as cells that fire together wire together. Basically, if one cell is regularly signaling to another cell and making it fire, the connection between those two neurons will get stronger and make it easier for those cells to communicate. We're pretty positive that a cellular process known as long-term potentiation, called LTP for short, is a critical sort of plasticity for helping us form new memories. LTP looks sort of like this. First, Neuron 1 repeatedly sends a signal to Neuron 2. This tells Neuron 2 to add more receptors to the postsynaptic terminal, which in turn tells Neuron 1 to release more neurotransmitters from the presynaptic terminal. Now, with more neurotransmitter being released and more receptors available to pick it up, the connection between the cells is much stronger. The more you use that connection, the stronger the memory. It turns out that there are a bunch of different kinds of LTP, and it happens all across the brain. 
but it's been most well studied in the hippocampus because of its connection to memory. And some scientists have figured out how to look directly at groups of neurons involved in particular memories. Like a 2016 study at MIT where scientists were able to tag the neurons in the hippocampus that were activated while mice were learning about a new environment. Later, when the scientists activated just those tagged neurons, they were able to trigger the same behavior, even though the mice weren't in the same environment. They're now exploring the effects of tagging neurons in different brain regions during memory formation and recall to get a better idea of how all of these different systems work together to encode and store memories over time. So eventually, we might be able to learn exactly where those algebra skills are stored and how to easily boost them. In the meantime, I'm afraid you're just gonna have to remember it on your own. Thanks for watching this episode of Neurotransmissions. If you've enjoyed it, hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to learn more about memories in the brain. If you really love what we do, please consider supporting us on Patreon. We couldn't do all of this without your support. Until our next transmission, I'm Ali Astrocyte. Over and out.